our next panel, while I had given them the title of Research and Innovation Panel, I believe just judging even looking at um, Sue has a presentation, your research is excellent and there's so much to be learned from research. And, and it's one thing I would be very keen on, you know, from my own experience, the more you read, the more you read on in terms of research area, the more learned you become in an area and that can be applied in the context of technical stuff, your professional development and also actually in, in the context of how to do professional development as well. So again, that would be kind of one area I looked at at, at doctorate level. So um, without uh, um, talking, I suppose, too much now beyond, we'd introduce the next panel. And our first speaker is uh, Dr. John Littlewood. John, thanks very much for joining us. Great, thank you very much, Irene. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just turn on my slideshow. OK, so welcome everybody. It's great to be here and um, great to be presenting uh, to such a, a well um, disciplined and uh, professional group. So my name is Dr John Littlewood from Cardiff Metropolitan University. I wear a number of hats both in university and external to the university and um, I've been working in the university sector in collaboration with industry for 25 years, uh, so I'm not I'm not a spring chicken, although I look I look it. I'm only joking. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples now of uh, how my research and innovation has informed learning both within the university sector and also with industry. So at the at the university, I for the last uh, 10 or 11 years, I, I joined the university in 2007 part time and 2008 full time. Uh, at a time when uh, the institution was um, expanding. Uh, I joined College School of Art and Design. At the time, there was no uh, research uh, inward facing or outward facing representing the built environment or engineering. And therefore, I was given the opportunity to establish uh, a research group. And uh, from 2018, this group has been called the Sustainable and Resilient Built Environment Group. Uh, we, we are undertaking applied research and innovation and enterprise, essentially consultancy with industry. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary group of engineers, architects, technologists, surveyors, interior designers, um, product designers, a range of engineers and currently we've got 16 uh, doctoral research students conducting research with industry in the UK, Canada, um, uh, UAE, Saudi Arabia and we've got 12 academic staff and technical demonstrators who are active uh, in research supporting our students but also conducting uh, research themselves and within Wales um, we have a um, uh, a piece of legislation that was launched in 2015 by the Welsh Government called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and any research or, or indeed work undertaken in Wales which has some form of public funding has to indicate how it will meet one of seven pillars or, or one or more of seven pillars which are represented on the left here from a globally responsive Wales prosperous Wales, resilient Wales, healthier Wales, more eco Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities and a Wales of vibrant culture and thi thriving Welsh language. And in, most of the research and innovation that we undertake fits into one or more of these seven pillars. And indeed, uh, in addition to this, we also uh, map into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17. We don't fit into all of them. Uh, but as we're a multidisciplinary group, we do fit into a number of the, uh, the goals. And so just a little bit of context to me, as you can imagine, for a 25 year uh, uh, career uh, in university working in collaboration with industry, uh, I've had a number of uh, projects. In fact, I've led over four, 45 um, externally funded research and innovation projects and, and generated uh, just under three million pounds of funding. And the majority of my work is, is aiming to deliver sustainable and resilient buildings. Um, for many years I was focused on environmental sustainability um, but as we've got many global challenges not least climate change but in the last two years um, the COVID-19 pandemic which has led to us rethinking buildings both existing and new uh, resilience is important. We can't have sustainable buildings without considering resilience. So my work crosses housing, innovative construction, innovation partnerships with uh, industry and international partnerships. I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but I'm going to give you some examples uh, today, particularly in the context of quality of life. Um, but before I do that, as a 
a member of the Chartered Association of Building Engineers and a Chartered Building me member. Um, I just wanted to touch upon uh, Cabe's um, um, definitions of CPD. Um, so it's a range of activities and training that professionals undertake to maintain their professional competence. And today I'm going to give some examples of events where we've disseminated CPD and also where I've facilitated CPD, uh, personal development and academic research. Personally, um, um, at Cardiff Met, I've been involved uh, and I've been invited to be a keynote pres presenter at international conferences. Uh, in 2009, I was funded by the British High Commission and one of our industrial partners to visit Kuala Lumpur and to give a, um, a presentation at a conference on green buildings. And I was tasked to deliver um, a CPD event on low energy housing for improved building performance, uh, particularly in that, in that context, thermal performance. In 2011, I should say also at the uh, event in Malaysia, I was the only academic. Uh, all the other attendees were actually uh, engineers in practice uh, across uh, from across uh, Malaysia. <coughs> uh, in 2011, I was invited by Kess International uh, to be a keynote at the third Sustainability in Energy and Buildings International Conference. I'm going to talk a little bit more about SEB, of which I'm the chair uh, for the last few years. It's a conference which is typically uh, attended by researchers from universities, scientists, but typically the, the attendees are working on research or innovation in collaboration with industry and funded by industry or funded by governments or, or a mixture of the two. Uh, to, in 2021, I gave a joint keynote at uh, another Case International Conference, uh, specifically looking at uh, the challenges of uh, COVID-19 and how we transition to a more resilient uh, world. Um, at that time, uh, early in the year, sorry, early last year, we were thinking, well, that in 2022, hopefully COVID-19 will disappear. It's very clear with the latest Omicron uh, variant that it's, it's going to be something that's with us for a long time. So I gave a joint keynote at that uh, conference with a professor of environmental public health um, on addressing challenges and opportunities through partnerships to mitigate against infection pandemics, climate change, particularly in the context of human quality of life and resilience to ch global challenges. Uh, I've also given invited presentations <coughs> Again with Kes International in 2013, which was a joint conference entitled Medita Mediterranean Green Energy Forum, which was in Fez, Morocco, uh, a very large international conference, and I was presenting on uh, building performance. In 2016, I gave an invited presentation on fire performance at the uh, Sustainability Energy uh, Sustainability Ecolo Engineering Ecological Design Society Conference SEEDS is our acronym. And again in 2021, measuring occupant quality of life. And SEEDS um, again is attended by uh, an academic audience, but uh, is typically also attended by industry partners. Uh, and they have a special day or half day uh, related to something called the RISE Awards. Uh, and the presentation I gave in 2021 uh, was at a special half day session on building performance. Uh, and I should say the um, each of the keynote and uh, invited sessions are delivered at, at various conferences. Attendees at those conferences are given CPD certificates for having attended those conferences. Now, in my role as the chair for CABE's Wales region, uh, of which I was uh, sworn in last night as uh, the chair for a second term, I was a ch I was chair for the in my first term from twenty. Uh, January 20 to uh, January 22 and I've got another term as chair for the next 20, uh, two years and I'm just illustrating on the screen here how we've facilitated through the Cape Wales region uh, a number of CPD events over the last two years. W one of my manifesto uh, criteria uh, when I put myself forward in 2019 was to start to facilitate hybrid events i.e. online events and also physical events. Little was I to know that COVID-19 was on the doorstep. And in fact, since I, I became chair in uh, uh, January 2020, all our CPD events have been uh, online. <clears throat> and so we've we've had a range of events and, and the 
many of the events that I've facilitated have been uh, in collaboration with partners that I've worked with in the past or current partners on research projects. Uh, so we've had Andy Sutton, who's the um, one of the founding uh, partners for Zero Homes discussing optimised retrofit, which is a pan Wales project with six. In fact, it's a pan UK project, but delivered in Wales to to optimise the retrofit to nearly zero energy operational energy of 1700 existing social housing properties properties in Wales. We had Nigel Jervis, who's the operations director from Team Our Lime, discussing environmental sustainability. Jasper Mead. Uh, managing director of people I see group discussing offsite manufacturing uh, in, uh, in, and then the second part of that build engine line we had Joseph Daniels talking about how to mainstream net zero built environment. Uh, I've never worked with Joseph Daniels uh, uh, however the other uh, attendees who were presenting I have collaborated with collaborated with Dr Penny Carey who's the sustainability lead for Porter, Ca Porter Cabin UK discussing the approach to sustainability for uh, off-site uh, manufactured steel frame buildings. We had Charlotte Hale and Verity Mohouse from Seven Nooks Modular, Charlotte Hale Operations Director, Verity Mohouse, KTP Associate for a KTP that, we're, that I'm currently managing, uh, delivering uh, off-site timber framed uh, MMC, um, and particularly in the context of skills development from apprenticeship up to level eight doctorates uh, in the UK. And then recently um, in December 2021, Verity Mohouse was actually poached to go and work for One Click LCA, which is an international company. Uh, it's, uh, it's a software company that um, has software to analyse uh, carbon uh, uh, baseline assessment, particularly in the context of embodied carbon, who gave a keynote uh, uh, at our uh, CPD event with one click CEO on an introduction to building and product LCAs. What are they? Why are they important? How, how do you conduct them? And last night we uh, had a uh, our Cape Wales AGM and we had Professor Andrew Geans, which I've, I've collaborated with for over 30 years. He taught me, he was one of my uh, PhD supervisors and we've uh, supervised a number of doctorates together uh, and, and worked on various projects and he's the head of SIPSI certification that's the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers and he gave a critical review of SIPSI's ventilation guidance for COVID-19 mitigation in the built environment which was uh, really interesting last night. So for, in that role of chair of Cape Wales I facilitated a number of CPD events. A number of other examples now uh, so Dr. Joe Atkinson, who I who was I, I taught as an undergraduate in architectural technology. She was Cardiff Met um, uh, best student in 2010, and indeed she went on to get the to win the uh, UK award for the best uh, SIAT student, and also the NH NHBC award, and also I think the CIOB award. Uh, and she stayed on with us, and she won um, with myself some funding from uh, the European Union to undertake a PhD to evaluate external, external wall insulation retrofitted to social housing in Wales, which was co-funded by Coastal Housing Group, which is one of the largest social housing uh, providers in Wales with circa 6,000 existing homes, uh, which I co-supervised co with Professor George Grani uh, from Cardiff Met and Professor Andrew Geans from Sibsey. We, know, we used a range of methods to evaluate the effectiveness of exterior wall insulation from site observations, critical review of, of construction details and also using thermography. And at the time thermography in the UK was typically used on buildings which were completed, but we were using it on uh, dwellings before and after retrofit uh, as a methodology to evaluate whether heat loss was um, uh, reduced following exterior wall insulation. And in this example I'm showing on the screen, it certainly was, uh, heat loss was certainly reduced. Um, but unfortunately, because of some of the uh, contractors um, installation of uh, exterior wall insulation, as you can see from this bottom left picture, um, some of the installation wasn't correct. Often they were they were um, installing the insta installation around um, um, satellite dishes, um, in this case on the bottom left, actually around the scaffolding that was in installed in place to install the insulation, so not perfect. However, um, um, what we demonstrated was that there was some alleviation from fuel poverty. 
and we disseminated this work through academic peer review publications, which are both both of which uh, the examples I'm showing you are open source, which basically means anybody can view them from practitioners to the general public to academics. And you also presented at a number of professional body um, events in Wales and in, also in the UK. Second example of quality of life um, research and innovation is the project I led from 2015 to 17 to develop a, a building fire safety measurement and reporting pro protocol, um, basically coming out of some research that I completed in 2013, where I identified that in new dwellings, often fire stopping and compartmentation wasn't actually adequate, i.e. if in the event of a fire, the fire stopping uh, and, and compartmentation wouldn't prevent the, sp the spread of smoke, toxic gas and fire. And, and therefore, in collaboration with Coastal Housing Group, uh, David Green is the CEO and Professor Steve Goodyear from the University of Plymouth. We developed a protocol uh, to assess um, non in a non-destructive way uh, whether uh, fire stopping would work in practice. And in fact, during the project, um, the Grenfell, the disastrous Grenfell uh, fire uh, happened in London, of which we can see an example here of, the, of one of the pictures top left where unfortunately 68 people were killed on an existing uh, tower block in London which had been retrofitted with insulation that whilst it had a good thermal performance was combustible and unfortunately that caught fire which caused the fire and led to a cast catastrophic um, failure of the building uh, and life. So the, and um, as part of this research project we we developed this protocol which is basically using um, uh, air, air permeability testing equipment, uh, artificial smoke generation and, uh, and both qualitative and quantitative ways to measure uh, smoke spread. And in all the examples we tested, we we've tested multi-storey apartment buildings. One example here, it's, it's timber frame uh, and brick <coughs> external clad. Um, that we, we, it was a three storey building. We tested a, a, a middle floor flat and we found smoke present in 12 other flats, in, sorry, nine other flats in under five minutes. Smoke was spreading both horizontally, vertically and diagonally, um, demonstrating that fire stopping of compartmentation wasn't actually installed correctly. And in fact, it was actually a, a, a social housing uh, project, but it was developed by a, a private developer, one of the largest private developers in the UK, and they undertook non-destructive testing, and it was actually identified that fire stopping was never installed. So if in the event of an actual fire in, the, in this building, it should, ha should have had a 60-minute um, uh, fire prevention, um, catastrophic fire would have spread very quickly. In fact, during this project, I disseminated the research findings to uh, the Institution of Fire Engineers at the 2016 uh, Annual General Meeting and the Institution of Fire Engineers International Conference uh, in Birmingham. And I met with um, uh, fire station chiefs from Chicago, uh, Vancouver, in a number of cities in India and also in Malaysia who were saying yeah this would be a great technique to use in practice. Now we disseminated this work also through um, the SEB Sustainability and Energy in Building International Conference uh, in 2016. It was published in Energy Presidia. It was also published uh, as a journal paper in Engineering Sustainability and also in a book chapter by Springer uh, in uh, 2018. So um, as I mentioned already, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the Sustainability and Energy Buildings International Conference. In fact, I've been involved with it since 2010. I, I'm an editor, edit co-editor of the proceedings. Uh, I'm the chair of the conference saying, well, I've been a chair in 2014, co-chair in 2018, seven, 2017, sorry, as also, and general chair since 2019 um, and in this this year fingers crossed we'll be running the event uh, in Croatia it'll also be a hybrid event I'm also a, a co-editor of a book series from Springer called Advances in Sustainability Science and Technology um, which disseminates um, um, research and innovation which is industry-led 
in collaboration with universities. Now, one of the ideas in discussion with John Barfoot is that uh, the, the, the publications that we, we have published in academic uh, publications maybe could be summarised as uh, short papers in Building Engineer, which is the Chartered Association of Building Engineers um, uh, publication, which comes out uh, 10 times a year. In fact, I was in discussions with the uh, editor of the journal yesterday about this uh, very topic, because one of the problems to practitioners in academic peer reviewed conference uh, publications is unless they are open access uh, or indeed if they, unless they know about these publications they're not going to actually see the research innovation that's presented so if we're presenting in um, professional body publications that's a greater opportunity that practitioners can share in this CPD opportunity now at Cardiff Met um, we have a number of doctorates but one of which that I lead on in particularly in the context of the built environment and engineering um, are two pathways one in engineering and one in sustainable built environment and these are doctorates that are under undertaken by practitioners who are working potentially by university but more, more often by working in practice. In fact, the uh, speaker after me, Dr Joanna Clark, is our recent graduate from the Sustainable Built Environment Pathway. In fact, she's the first graduate from this pathway that was launched in 2016. And, and the aim of a professional doctorate is to work on three, one of three types of change. It's about, it can be proposing, implementing and evaluating change within, in the, within the professional con context. It can be about evaluating change that's already happening with a professional context and to give a different viewpoint, or it's about gaining a better understanding of the professional context to propose change. And in the third element, it may be that the change can't be delivered unless there's legislation change or the substantial investment by uh, an organisation or, or a group of organisations. And so the new Cardiff Met currently has 90 students across a a number of pathways. We currently have um, 11 candidates on the engineering stroke sustainable building built environment pathways in um, the UK, United Emirates, um, and we've got had, we had a graduate last year from uh, Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to give a, an example next before I finish on Dr. Geraldine Segila's work, who was the sustainability manager for Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi which is um, a 300 bed plus uh, platinum, uh, lead platinum hospital that was completed in 2016. And Geraldine uh, developed a, a water conservation strategy for the uh, external landscaping and water features, which were part of the um, quality of life um, um, treatment for patients at the hospital. Uh, and the hospital just over 21, the, the landscape uh, landscaping is, was, is just over 21,000 square metres, sorry, 32,000 square metres and the building is just over 21,000 square metres. Uh, and basically what Geraldine was trying to do was to reduce, if possible, if not eradicate the use of uh, desalinated water for la uh, landscaping uh, irrigation uh, during uh, during the year. In fact, she was she was able to do that through a range of um, recycling of water from the hospital um, facilities uh, during the study. In fact, she developed as part of the project a, a greenhouse gas metric, which has been um, uh, or it is being um, implemented across UAE uh, as part of their um, protocol to reduce uh, carbon emissions from buildings. And in fact, we Geraldine disseminated the, the work uh, both through a number of uh, international journals, conferences, and uh, through the uh, UAE uh, Green Building Council. In, in fact, she was actually given an award as a, a future leader in 2017 by the UEE uh, Green Building Council and she's now working for NEOM which is the Saudi Arabian government um, organization developing uh, zero carbon cities in the northwest of the country and she's the assistant director for sustainability uh, and that's the end of my uh, uh, presentation thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the session today and I can provide references on request if required. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, John. That was amazing. There's a lot to take in there. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our next speaker now, Dr. Joanna Clark, who just mentioned in, in John's presentation. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Am I off mute? You are, and oh, your slides okay. are sharing. Great, and you thanks. Can see my slides, great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so my presentation is going to be a little bit different to all the others that we've heard. It's not directly about CPD learning, but a different sort of form of learning. Um, I'm an architect formerly working in an architectural practice before I joined um, Specific, which is a project in Swansea University in Wales um, in 2013. And this is a research project where my role was to find better ways to link the research that's being undertaken at specific into low carbon technologies um, and link that better to um, the construction industry. So I'm just going to start by explaining a little bit about specific. Um, so here we are in South Wales um, within the UK. Um, and as I mentioned, we are a project within Swansea University. So um, Specific's work is very much focused on developing low carbon technologies for solutions for buildings, primarily focused on solar energy and on critically working with um, industry partners to help accelerate their technology developments. Um, so a key part of this has been to construct several building demonstrators um, and the way that these demonstrators then can be used for learning. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to what we mean by active buildings, which is um, the work that we do. Um, then I'll talk about some of the active building demonstrators and how they've been used um, for learning. So just to start with, um, an active building is one that supports the energy network by integrating renewable energy technologies for heat, power and transport. And it achieves this by storing locally generated energy, so energy that's generated on the roofs or the facades of the buildings, um, and then utilising smart control strategies and energy storage to balance the import and export of energy to and from the grid. And this is becoming more and more important as um, in the UK we've um, set targets to decarbonise both heat and transport within the next few years. So it's it's a massive challenge for buildings and I think um, the way we use energy is becoming almost as important as how much energy that we use. So this energy balancing is um, hugely important. So we've got six overarching principles to an active building. The first two are concerned with reducing the amount of energy that's needed by the building before then considering energy generation and energy storage technologies. Um, and then crucially how that energy is managed. Um, using controls, um, the energy storage and also electric vehicles which can link into the buildings. And this is just provides one way of um, tackling, um, oh, one way is to try and meet our zero carbon targets in the UK. Um, and some of the benefits are listed here. So we have lower carbon emissions, lower fuel bills, reduced energy consumption, a little bit of energy independence, so our buildings are designed to be able to um, operate autonomously for a day or two on the battery storage. Um, and crucially, which I'll show you in on one of the later slides, is presenting a flat load profile to the grid so that it's not um, aware of all the sorts of um, energy demands and energy generation that's that's fed into the grid. So these are our two main um, building demonstrators that are located on Swans University's Bay Campus, our active classroom, which I'm going to talk about first here on the right, and the active office, um, which I'll talk about afterwards. So the active classroom we built in 2016, um, and it was very experimental. So one of our main roles, as I mentioned earlier, was to work with um, company organisations who were developing new technologies as well as our own researchers who are developing technologies for buildings. Um, and the building demonstrators provide a nice way to test technologies in real world situations. So it's all very well testing them in isolation, but when we try to integrate them into buildings, we learn a lot more about them. So this building actually trialled a new form of offsite construction that had not been used in um, on a building before, or only on an experimental building. So it's quite a risk, which you can imagine lots of people in construction wouldn't be able to take on. But as a research organisation, we were 
happy to take on that risk and we built the building using that new form of construction. This picture that you can see here is um, a new form of building integrated photovoltaics. So solar panels on the roof that are thin film modules bonded to steel roof sheeting. And this was the first installation by a company called BIPV Co who are located in South Wales. So for them, it was really important to be able to test this in a real world situation, not only in terms of the performance of the roof, but also aesthetically were people, um, you know, what did people think about the aesthetics? How easy was it to install? What are the other benefits that people could see by seeing it actually integrated into a building? And actually it was installed very, very quickly and starts generating um, as soon as it was installed. Um, and people were quite um, impressed with how quickly it, it became popular. And now the company have gone on to um, improve their product, develop their product further and get certification. So it's been really helpful in their product development. The um, technology that you can see on here is basically um, it's perforated steel cladding. When the sun shines on that cladding and forms a, a warm layer of air, the tiny perforations that you can just about make out in the picture allow that warm air to be drawn into the building with a small powered fan and that provides space heating for the building and also feeds into the hot water system. So it's a very low tech form of solar heating. Um, then we trialled different sorts of battery technologies. So we, these are salt water batteries which are um, cradle to cradle certified. So there's nothing nasty in them. They don't use any toxic materials and everything in them can be um, recycled. We've um, more recently replaced these with something called flow batteries, which is another new technology. So we're able to test these different technologies using the building. It's a useful engagement tool. As you can see here, we have groups of school children visit the building, but it also is used for teaching by the university. Um, and we hold lots of seminars, lots of events at the building and lots of tours by everyone from school children to government ministers and construction professionals, developers, all sorts of people visit the buildings. Um, and this here is um, a prototype photovoltaic window that we trialled for one of our partner organisations, NSG Pilkington. The active office then was slightly less experimental and, and also slightly more sophisticated than the classroom. We built this in 2018. Um, the newest technology that we have on this building is the tubes that you can see in this image on our south elevation. So these are a combined solar thermal and PV system. So they generate both electricity and heat in one neat system, which is great when you're looking at sort of space constrained south elevations on buildings. You're often fighting for um, windows on the south elevation so people can have views and lots of sunshine. Um, but to put technologies on then it's quite nice to be able to combine them together. And this was another new um, UK company called Naked Energy. And this was their first installation of this size and their first installation on a vertical facade. So we were able to help again with their product development, which was um, great for us and great for the company. In this building, we included a thermal store. So you can see here a big water tank. So these tubes feed into this large thermal store via a smaller tank, and that provides our space heating and hot water. Um, what's really important for us on this building is, um, and both buildings really, is all the data that we collect. We collect an awful lot of data from both buildings and we can use this for um, fault finding um, and also for optimising systems and developing different control strategies. And we're able to show a lot of this data on this screen that you can see here. So this is our energy dashboard, which is located in the foyer of the active office. Um, and this shows at any one time how much energy we're generating, how full the, st the storage is. You've got the thermal store here and the batteries here, where that energy is being used um, and how that relates to the external environment. Um, so it's really nice to be able to sort of educate people in terms of their energy use, make, makes people become more um, aware of the energy. And what's really important is the what I mentioned earlier about presenting that flat load profile to the grid. So you can see on these two graphs here, um, no matter whether we're um, using heating or charging electric vehicles, so you can see the green spikes here 
are when we're charging electric vehicles. The yellow spikes are when the heating comes on. The grid doesn't see that, it just sees a flat profile. And I think that's going to become really more important as we move forward so that we're not sort of putting too much pressure on the grid, either by exporting energy into the grid when the grid doesn't need it or importing when the grid's already under strain. So this is where the energy storage and controls really come in. Um, this slide then I've just put in just to show different ways that we can illustrate the data. So um, we are collecting, as I mentioned, a lot of data from both buildings. Um, from all areas. So we've got heat meters. You can see here the little sort of thermometer symbol throughout the heat distribution pipework, and that really helps us to determine where there are faults. So if there's a fault from the tubes to the tank, we can see that very quickly and, and remedy it. Or if there's a fault here, we know that, you know, the air handling units are not going to be operating properly. So we can quickly detect faults and fix them. And that's really useful. And then we collect data on things like the room temperature, relative humidity, the number of occupants in the space and the air quality, um, which is really important as well. So we're trying to maintain a constant temperature throughout the building. Um, so then I just wanted to mention how these buildings are actually being used for learning. So the first thing I think is really important is that the data we collect can be used for true building performance evaluation. Um, the buildings have highlighted the role of data monitoring for fast fault detection and remediation that I just mentioned, performance optimization, and development of the control strategies. And we've been able to demonstrate how different control strategies affect the operational carbon of technologies and consequently the whole life carbon, as well as being able to save us money. So we saved um, a megawatt of energy from the first year of operation to the second, purely by collecting this data and being able to identify where things weren't working as they should. They enable collection of data and feedback on the performance of technologies that we can then feed back to our supply chain partners for product development, as I mentioned, um, and also for the um, different companies showing the new technologies integrated in a building also helps the companies promote their technologies and maybe help secure um, further funding. They've also helped improve the connection between academia and the construction industry. So we've got shared learning between going both ways. So the researchers learn about the challenges that they need to address in thinking about how the construction industry could adopt their technologies, how they could be integrated into buildings, um, building fabric and also the building services. And then the construction industry learn about novel solutions to help them meet their zero carbon targets. So we have a lot of um, interest and lots of people invite us to join their design teams um, on their projects just because we have this connection with um, the latest technologies. Um, we've used the buildings to engage with um, lots of as I mentioned, people at all sorts of different levels. So they've been the subject of many seminars, talks and lectures where we can share the knowledge that we've gained from integrating new and existing technologies into buildings to achieve the lowest operational energy and carbon possible. We engaged with schools and we've created a toolkit of documents sharing our learnings with others seeking low carbon solutions for their building projects. This was actually the subject of my doctoral research project that I um, undertook with John, as he mentioned earlier. Um, and one of the learning tools we developed just before um, COVID hit in March last year was a virtual building tour. And this has been really useful in enabling us to continue engagement um, while physical visits were not possible to the building. So for example, if you click on this link here, it will take you to a video um, of how the building was constructed. Um, and if you click here, you can get to more um, information about the combined solar thermal and PV system um, by Naked Energy. So there's lots of these little buttons throughout the tour um, and the link on this slide um, will take you to that tour. Um, I won't go into these in detail, but they're just some examples of companies that we've been able to engage with. Um, and projects that we've supported using our demonstrators. You can find more information on each of them on these links here. But for example, the first project, um, which was called FRED, Flexibly Responsive Energy Demand, explored um, what I've been mentioning about demand side response. So how you can use um, buildings as virtual power plants to help um, 
alleviate stresses on the on the energy grids. The second one then was using low powered um, devices, low powered sensors in buildings, because one of the things that we found is the more sensors you put in buildings, obviously they then use energy as well. Um, and your small power adds up, which um, leads to this project, the last project here. Um, small power is uh, the term used to describe anything that you plug into buildings, um, which is supposedly small amounts, but when you add them up, they actually account for quite a lot of energy, particularly in offices. So we've trialed some smart plugs, smart plug sockets by this company called Measurable, who um, are actually um, developing the, the sockets that will help people realise how much energy that they're using, um, and then they can maybe lower it. And this has been trialled by one of the contractors using our active classroom, who are now going to roll it out across their construction sites. Um, and I'll just quickly mention a sister project that um, I'm involved with called Sunrise, which um, was funded in 2017. And this is focused on delivering classroom or community type buildings in rural Indian villages where they have significant issues with their electrical supply, um, which is intermittent and unreliable. So there's been a lot of ongoing research into the best locations for these buildings. And we're currently, we've worked up this design here um, and it's actually be being constructed within the next month or two. Um, and that's quite exciting because um, it shows how we can translate all the learnings that we've had in this country into other countries as well through partnerships with different organisations. Um, and this is the toolkit that I mentioned. Um, so these are developed, as I said, to share our learning with others and provide useful guidance for anyone embarking on their own active building or low carbon project. So we've got case studies, um, detailed case studies of our buildings. Um, we've got monitoring specifications, um, checklists, the dashboard specification and design guidance. Um, and we're always working on further documents to add to this um, as, as we go forward and as we learn more. Um, and then just finally, more information on our demonstrators and their sort of role in um, in helping low carbon technology development was we've, we've written a paper which is published here in Nature Energy, which there's a link to here. And there's a link to my doctoral research work on my blog here. And then I'll just finish with a nod to our funders. We're funded through the Welsh European Funding Office and UKRI. And our main industrial partners are Tata Steel, NSG and Axon Nobel. That's me. Thank you for listening. We're just going to stop sharing now. Thanks so, Thanks much, so much, Joanna. Joanna. <laughs> that was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. presentation. So, much so much going on there. I definitely am going to come visit. visit. Um, just introduce our next speaker now. Um, if uh, we could uh, have Yutayan, Dr. Yutayan, to come on and talk a little bit about his research and his take on professional development and in that context and where he sees us going with it. Thanks, Yutayan. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the National Forum Seminar. This is a time to explore the authentic and appropriate built environment of continuing professional development educational practice. Thank you, Professor Irene, Dr. Joan, and the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education for the high invitation to present at today's seminar. I am happy to present Continuing Provisional Development and Research and Innovation. My name is Uthayan Raja, co-presenters of this seminar, Professor Dr. John Littlewood, Dr. Jonah Clark, and Professor Lindsay Richard. Thanks a lot for the great presentation by Professor Dr. John and Dr. Jonah. It is unique and wonderful. Thanks a lot for the earlier panel presenters for the excellent presentation. I learned a lot on teaching and learning. The continuing professional development in the built environment and research and innovation or development can go together. Without continuing professional development, there will not be research and development. It goes hand in hand. 
Therefore, I will discuss continuing professional development and research and development in the built environment shortly. Continuing professional development is of paramount importance, leading to research and development. The following items I am going to touch shortly. The continuing professional development in the build environment. What is good build environment design? What is holistic approach? Continuing professional development, research and innovation or development. What is authentic and appropriate research? Why group work is necessary in continuing professional development? Problems or gaps and solutions. My research and innovation or development. Continuing professional development in the built environment is essential to keep up to date with new changes in practice and technological development or improvement. Most professional licensing associations request professional development hours for membership renewal, like engineers, medical doctors, and nurses in some countries, including Canada. In Canada, the building engineers require professional development hours to keep the professional membership. Therefore, continuing professional development is essential for built environment professionals. Good built environment design is a compromise that meets the biodiversity needs while balancing the built environment standards, economy, and regulatory context. The traditional design focuses on trying to meet the respective discipline standards, economy, and regulatory context. It doesn't approach holistically to save energy, reduce carbon emission and global warming while maintaining the health, well-being and quality of life of the biodiversity. Therefore, there are several gaps that require research and innovation. Holistic approach address complete or all-inclusive or well-rounded approach. Authentic or genuine and appropriate or suitable research can be achieved through a holistic approach. Continuing professional development is required to keep up-to-date knowledge and understand the multidisciplinary work in the built environment. Anthropogenic design need to address the built environment's health, well-being and quality of life of the biodiversity such as human being, flora and fauna. We begin our journey with ignorance, I, or inexperience, I, to ordinary knowledge is okay, to operational knowledge is okay, I, okay, okay, is fine for living, but not good enough for those who have a thirst to learn and contribute to the society. Is it best option to move from I OK OK to proficiency and finally to mastery? Yes, it is. I am OK OK or I OK to 2 PM is the best option for continuing professional development and research and development or innovation. Please note that acronym PM is not prime minister or project manager. It is proficiency and mastery. Now, look at this diagram. A person become I OK OK to PM. It is where they started to observe the gaps in knowledge. Therefore, it is essential to do research and development or innovation to fill the gaps and contribute to the society. Someone told me it is better to put LLL instead of CPD. Now there are a lot of acronyms. Most people don't know what it means. Sometimes they confuse. Does anyone knows what LLL means? 
I am still learning. So typically, LLL means live, laugh, love or lifelong learning. If you put them beside each other, it also works very well. Live life, laugh long, love learning. If you love learning, you need to have a passion. How to create such passion? Now we can look at this Venn diagram. It visually represents similarities and differences between the concepts. We pay to do what we like is a profession. We pay to do what the world needs is vocation or inclinations. We love to do what we know is a passion. We love to do what the world needs is mission. So we need love the provision to do continuing provisional development and research and development and innovations. As you can see, the provisional victory is passion and mission. Now, look at this diagram, the acronyms AMMA, AMMA, which reflect the following. A for ability. We have the ability to do many things such as gardening, cooking, cleaning, playing, repairing car or computer, studying and more. The first M is referred to motivation. We are motivated to do few things which is called passion such as architectural design, build environment design, engineering or something else. The next M for monitoring, we need to monitor our passionate work continuously. Next one, A for attitude. Attitude is how well we can do the passionate work. In my language, Tamil, Amma means is mother. Therefore, you can also say mother of research and innovation or development is Amma. Amma give you continuous, continuing professional development and research and innovation or development. The continuous professional development is a continuing passion development. Now we can look at one critical key acronyms. The acronym is not a big issue, but the important thing is what is key to success? Or what is key to lifelong learning? K for keep, E for educating, Y for yourself. Keep educating yourself is a key to success. Michael Angelo said at the age of 87, I am still learning. Albert Einstein said, once you stop learning, you start dying. You can find the gaps in the current provision when you keep educating yourself. That is where research and development innovation take birth. What is authentic and appropriate research? Authentic and appropriate research can be achieved through a holistic approach. 5 W's and 1 H is a formula for capturing a complete story of research. Why, what, where, when, who and how. Let us look at more closely what it means. A researcher can ask these interrogative questions to find answers through research and innovations or development considered as authentic and appropriate. Now, look at this diagram. Each question should stimulate an accurate and appropriate answer. Why this, re why this research and innovation is necessary? Who is going to benefit from this research and innovation? Where are this research and innovation required? What are you going to research or innovate? And when do you need this research and innovations?
How are you going to do this research and innovation? These are the questions, these are the interrogative questions clearly emphasize the importance of authentic and appropriate research and innovation or development in the built environment. Why is the group work necessary in continuing provisional development? The built environment is multidisciplinary teamwork. Therefore, continuing provisional development must include a group work. Without team effort, we cannot achieve anything. As Vince Lombardi, an American football coach and executive said, individual commitment to a group effort, that is what makes a team work, a company work, a society work, and a civilization work. Look at these problems or gaps and solution. The so following affect the society in the built environment. Resources affect the society, technological development affect the society, climate change affect the society, education affect the society, business affect the society, human interaction affect the society. To protect the society and the built environment, continuing provisional development and research and development are necessary. We can see the future more clearly and do it today for the future society. Therefore, we need to have a concrete action now. The following is a list of my recent peer review research paper in the built environment. You can open access online to read the abstracts and references. If anyone interested in reading, the full papers can be purchased online. Thank you so much for your attention. I will catch up on any missing information in Q&A. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much, Uthai. That was a really great presentation. I uh, really appreciate that. And loads to learn. I, I love your ethos and your theories and your ideologies and your acronyms. We'll talk about them maybe after the next presenter. So our final presenter for the evening, we save the best to last, um, Dr. Lindsay Richards. Lindsay, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Great. That'll work, yeah? Great. Brilliant, brilliant, thanks. Um, so, um, good evening, good morning. Um, I feel I have the graveyard shift here and uh, as, as if I'm actually in a seance, I'm moving my mouse, mouse around here, not sure how many people are there and trying to contact people, but um, uh, thank you for, uh, for still listening. Um, my name is uh, Lindsay Richards. Um, I'm a senior lecturer and former head of School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Wales Trinity. Um, I'm a Charter Quantity Surveyor um, with my own uh, actual chartered engineering and surveying practice in, uh, in Wales. Um, and I have over 40 years experience within the construction industry. Um, so CPD is something that um, I've been involved with for, for many, many years. Um, we have a mix of part-time and full-time students at UWTSD, but in actual fact, um, all of our students work alongside their studies, such as the demand for construction professionals uh, at the moment in the UK. Um, uh, alongside that, um, we also have uh, an agreement with the local authority um, who, through their framework agreements, um, uh, allow us and community benefits with the contractors um, for our students to attend um, site quite regularly. So, um, so we have that going alongside um, our studies too. Um, but CPD and the notion of lifelong learning um, can seem overwhelming to young professionals. And I'm actually going to talk uh, this evening about what we can do to prepare and support future professionals and also current professionals who sometimes get lost in the need for unusefulness of CPD. Um, so basically as an academic and also managing director of a professional construction practice, I understand fully the importance of the, the practical application of continuous learning by employing individuals, obviously. 
and the formal structures that are necessary to assess CPD amongst professionals. Irene has provided us with some excellent material in our packs today, um, really informative and, and well structured and we're very, really impressed actually. Uh, for some time the industry has been criticised for its fragmented approach. As with anything, we need something extreme to happen or to occur to highlight the shortfalls and weaknesses across the industry. And recently, professional competence has come under severe scrutiny after the Grenfell disaster and particularly in response to the Hackett report. We will see great change in the assessment of CPD and reflective practice is actually going to be a very important part of where how we continue with CPD in our industry. Most professional associations or institutions have a set guidelines of how they wish to see CPD recorded uh, and its wider use requirements, formal or structured CPD and then informal with a, a percentage or a spread across each. But we know as an industry that that isn't enough anymore, I'm afraid. How can we prove the learning has taken place, that the professional has actually developed and that it has enhanced their professional understanding and improved their competence? It's vitally important that in order to demonstrate the learning has been appropriate and beneficial to the individual, there's a method that an individual is able to convey their understanding. And do we think current methods are enough? What else can we do? We should be considering a method of recording that understanding and demonstration of the application of learning in some way. We can make a more comprehensive list of methods of learning and development, and I've seen some really excellent suggestions today um, where the categories are clear and well defined. But how can we prove it's not just a checklist and there's actual competences gained? We can assess formal qualifications, but what about the actual transferal of that learning to the required task in the workplace? Well, we can do that through professional accreditation. We rely on the professional bodies to test for professional uh, assessment at the time that somebody graduates. But what happens with continual professional development? What happens during the, the, the length of somebody's career? There's a need to equip future professionals with the necessary reflective skills to enable them to demonstrate that learning. Now, reflective practice as opposed to reflection is a systematic approach. And it's extremely difficult for some people to grasp. The experience needs to be captured and expressed in some form, usually written, um, but it has to be done in a, a systematic way so that everybody understands it. Uh, now, Irene in her material today has, um, has given some examples of other industries and the things that they do for CPD. The health industry is quite an interesting one because for some time they've been considering this aspect of reflection, a reflective practice, and therefore they're well ahead of us, as they should be actually. Um, but I feel that the construction industry um, needs to catch up, maybe. This systematic approach uses a, flex a flexible way of looking at reflective practice. It's a process of critical evaluation and self-assessment whereby the individual deeply explores an event in order to learn from that experience and consequently undertakes a change in their perception or behaviour. So reflective practice can benefit practice through enhancing professionalism, more importantly, and encouraging self-directed learning so that the individual knows exactly where their shortfalls are and they're getting the, the proper um, uh, professional competence training that's needed to, um, to overcome those shortfalls. So it enables professionals to understand shortfalls and strengths and choose appropriate learning to overcome these shortfalls. And I say appropriate learning because that's really important. So the Construction Wales Innovation Centre, a centre funded by both the CITB, Construction Industry Training Board in the UK, and also UWTSD, the university I work for, we design our modules to fit exactly with industry's needs. And we do this by using a formal board through QUIC, through the Construction Wales Innovation Centre. The board is made up of construction organisations, professional services organisations, um, the professional bodies, and we categorise and prioritise a number of skills that industry feels that um, our undergraduates need to, to, to learn. But we also look at that continuing requirement when they're actually in the workplace. 
We aim to future proof our courses as much as possible, and we designed a module um, that covers the areas that we feel will equip our students. The module is called self-development, professional practice and the management of construction personnel. And it, it's our way, if you like, in trying to identify the shortfall in CPD and what we can do to overcome it. Uh, interestingly, our students are able to attend CPD events regularly um, through quick because uh, Construction Wales Innovation Centre is actually part of the university too. Um, so the module covers subject areas um, like emotional intelligence, identifying one's own strengths and weaknesses, leadership, teamwork. More importantly, it looks at professionalism, it looks at ethics and it looks at reflection. And reflection is the main current through the formal summative assessment that we carry out for that module. So of course, CPD goes hand in hand to professional ethics. You can't have one without the other. The use of unsuitable CPD or merely ticking a box and filling in hours is unprofessional. But it's more than that. I mentioned professional ethics and moral practice here, um, as it's important to highlight the need for individuals to understand the ethical need to ensure competence. If a professional knows their limitations within an area, but has indicated gaining expertise in that area, they're clearly not proficient and that this is just not, this is just morally wrong, um, completely unethical. It could affect public safety. Um, <laughs> it could certainly affect professional liability indemnity. Um, so we need to ensure our students are aware of this and that young trainees are aware of it too. And on the subject of moral standards, Richard Flynn is the CABE chair of the Membership and Professional Standards Committee. He recently referred to a piece that CABE's technical director, Richard Harrell, wrote in the journal about ethics. Richard suggested in the case of ethical professionalism, they must be derived for combination of a professional code of ethics and a standard of governance that ensures compliance. But also suggests that this is not enough and that we must create corporate and individual accountability, as well as a culture of ethical behaviour in our associations and institutions. And I fully agree with this. Um, individual accountability is the key in CPD. So reflective practice and self-awareness over a longer time can illustrate the professional's learning by their transference of that learning to a situation. Uh, the identification of the needs uh, for learning can be more straightforward. I'll give you an example. A contractor on site involves additional work within their valuation, monthly valuation. Uh, a trainee QS um, checks this over and sees there's not an AI to cover that particular uh, instruction, but really aren't particularly sure about the contractual situation and how much they should be paying the contractor. So that trainee goes away, they'll read up on that, and the next time they approach with that sort of situ situation or scenario, they know exactly where they are. They can record that within their logbooks and journals, and that gives a clear indication of development, if you like, of a, of a situation, an understanding of the application of something towards an event. We're learning all the time, and from everything we do, every conversation we have, every strand of information that comes our way, um, we absorb subconsciously. On a day-to-day -day basis, we learn from our peers within the industry. We in turn share our experiences, and in those processes, other people are learning from us. Now in Welsh, we have a really interesting word, um, dusky. Dusky means learning in Welsh, but it also means teaching. Um, which, which is really interesting, um, but it's very late in the day and I'm not going to give you any more Welsh lessons, you'll be pleased to hear, but, uh, but just an interesting uh, aside. Quite often we see or we use reflective practice without even realising it, but approaching it by using a structured framework makes it more easier. So when beginning a reflective session with students, I may ask them to ask themselves a question about an experience. For example, you know, what didn't go well on site with that particular situation? This forces them to consciously think about their experience in depth in order to gain a better understanding of themselves. And it allows them to gain, uh, allows them to carry out similar activities and tasks more successfully in the future. So, we're looking at ensuring the students understand a holistic approach to CPD and their learning rather than just 
looking through a list of CBD events and ticking which ones they think are a good idea to attend. The medical profession has used reflective practice, as I've already mentioned, for some time, and they've used models like um, Chris John's model um, uh, of reflective practice and also Gibbs. So again, I'm not going to go into too much detail of how I cover reflective practice in my lectures, but, but just really in a nutshell. Um, John's model quite simply um, provides a structure by looking at five phases with Q questions. So a description of the experience or event, reflection on that event, influencing factors, anything that's happened which are outside the control of the individual, and then questioning, could they have dealt differently with that situation or in a better way? What have they learned from there? And there's also another area there which looks at um, what do I need to learn? So that's cyclical by nature and uh, quite a straightforward um, approach to use, to be honest. It directs the learner to identify what information is needed to be accessed in order to learn from the experience. So it makes it a lot easier to follow. Um, Gibbs's model of reflection is very similar, um, a useful way to break down really an approach to reflection and considering a task. So they allow the students to identify and understand the strengths and weaknesses as well, which is really useful. Now, these models allow students to, at the start of their career, um, to look at the list that's available to them. The list is endless, but as they, they continue through their career path, um, they, they're obviously going to be becoming more competent and, uh, and that list uh, reduces, if you like. So some of you will be aware of uh, a very old uh, model that we previously used for experiential learning, Kolb's model. Um, which um, is still quite useful today. And in fact, most of these models are based on, on that model originally. Um, so the theory has been around for a long time, but the use of detailed log books and journals has been around for a long time as well. But we need to tie these together. We need to be looking at a structured approach to recording CPD. Reflective practice is a crucial part of developing new skills within the construction industry. But it's even more fundamental than that because it develops the capacity of the individual um, so that they're able to respond to changes and challenges more easily, ability to make timely decisions in the construction industry. It's something which drives us. The ability to manage emotions and cope with stress. And again, this is an environment within the construction industry that we've got to prepare uh, our trainees for. So these are all part of a more holistic professional development. And to conclude here, um, I always tell my students when we're looking at continuing professional development that the P is for personal as well as professional, um, because the professional should make their CPD personal to them and consider carefully how it can develop their skills. Any development counts as long as it's relevant to their job role and they can demonstrate that development, but they must always bear in mind the professional ethics that go along with that and with that decision and, and filling out their journal. So, thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much to Irene and the team for facilitating the forum. It's been a great event. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed watching that. Um, I apologise to anyone online. We have run over time slightly, so if we could get the second panel on, if everyone would switch on their microphones and the cameras and everyone else who's here just to switch off their cameras so there's no confusion and we'll all be present then in the live event and maybe just have a chat about um, how you felt, you know, in terms of your presentations for routine yourselves, if there's any comments you'd like to add uh, or anything. I might just start the ball rolling. If if I can, but we, I'll keep it quite short and sweet and to the point. The big thing that jumped out at me really when, especially when I started to see initially John's presentation, John, thank you so much for that. Um, I really need to start reading all your papers. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking that I like, I really like your, the initiative that you're taking now with CABE as a profession body to publish a short version of academic peer reviewed papers and research to get that message out there for people to be able to use it as professional development. Uh, I would love to 
see every professional body doing that. And I would actually love to see professional bodies sharing it between themselves. So not just, you know, as John Barford mentioned, the, that academics need to start sharing resources in this digital culture transformation, but professional bodies as well. And, and some of your um, presentations in the chaos West region, again, was on, I would have loved to have heard about them and if they were online, watch them, you know. I don't know if any, if you'd have a comment on that, John, or anybody else there. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we, what's represented is, with the we four speakers is that there are there are there are links between us. I mean, we've got three in, uh, higher education institutions in Wales. We've got Swansea University, we've got University of Wales Trinity St David, we've got Car Cardiff Metropolitan University, and indeed Euthynion and Joanna uh, have been research students with us. Um, and Euthynion is also an existing lecturer from Ryerson University in Toronto. Um, so we, as part of our sort of day jobs. Uh, even if we're not in a lecturing role, uh, we're actually engaging with uh, practice. Uh, you know, we've got our own personal CPD, but through our, our activities, we are uh, sort of disseminating and facilitating CPD to the wider practitioners outside of our organisation. I think that's the great thing about uh, South Wales in particular, is that most people know each other very well if you work in the built environment. Um, and through the sort of international links now, uh, in a, each of our institutions, um, you know, we, we tend to stay in touch with each other. I mean, um, I won't say how long I've known Lindsay, but she taught me we, we're, we're friends and um, uh, we're working with, in CAVE and, you know, the, the PhD students I've, I've supervised, um, uh, the ones I'm supervising tend to, tend to become friends and, and collaborators and, and once they've, they've, they've graduated, I would say the same as well. So, um, I think we're a friendly bunch and um, that's one of the good things about um, uh, working together and collaborating. And you know, if we don't, I think I think as Lizzie said, you know, it's about personal um, reflections. Um, I mean, part of the Prof Doc is we the, the there's an element of reflective practice which we teach and it's about being able to, to, to engage with each other. And that, I think that's the, one of the most important things. Um, anyway, I'll shut up now because I'm hogging the microphone. Uh, I, I, I'd just like to add something there too. So um, th through CABE, you know, J John Saludi's chair, obviously from uh, uh, CABE Wales um, for the next two years. Um, I'm, I'm secretary actually, regional secretary too. But what we've um, suddenly um, started to do is with our CPD events, um, we are making them more inclusive. So we're, we're going across the professional institutions. We, you, we're using a common base, and um, and and I think it's um, it, it's a great great way to share information too. But um, it's this idea of passing, getting out to those silos, and actually sharing information. Yeah, well, the Engineers Ireland Academic Society has made the point of that and making everything open access. Just getting to the people that you want uh, involved in the discussion and the webinar, that's really where I suppose we need to grow, you know, our membership for our catchment. And I, I'd imagine I would uh, definitely enjoy a visit to Wales and to make some networking contact in there as well with you all. Uh, and um, Uthine, you've come all the way from Toronto to connect in with us and you're skipping your lunch. I'm just looking at the time difference you're five hours behind us. So I, I thank you so much. And rather than you get too hungry, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, no, it is absolutely great. Actually, this is a great opportunity for me to interact with you, all of you. And then that is also part of my continuous professional development mm -hmm. is a lifelong learning journey. Everybody learning. So uh, that is I always consider my whatever I have learned little. So there are a lot of things like a universal amount of things we had to learn. So I, I learned a lot of things from Professor Dr. John Littlewood. So he helped me a lot to <laughs> publish so many papers and stuff like that. So that's also a part of the journey that a uh, great opportunity to share the information uh, between the students and professionals. That is the only way we can grow and then move forward this society in a different level. That is how the society so far grow and develop this far. And we are we are facing the pandemic, so we, we are resilient and we are uh, the same thing is built environment that will be resilient. So we are moving forward and succeeding all those things in an appropriate way by having a good cooperation and love and care and supporting each other. So that's a great part of it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's very evident in, in all your presentations that there's a real comfort amongst yourselves as a, and uh, spearheaded through 
Lindsay, his teaching of John and John's dissemination of that ethos right through to all his PhD students and postdoc students as well. And uh, Joanna, I have to say I really enjoyed the presentation on specific. I will definitely be in contact from my own perspective to, to come maybe get you uh, online to do a presentation for students. But also I see the usefulness of your active building toolkits to be used for CPD purposes for people working across the entire built environment. There's so much to be learned from that and even to go onto your website and go on and watch the videos and do the 3D walk around and and actually see and learn and look and there'll be more questions than answers I'm sure but the, those sort of resources are wonderful and you're sharing them so freely and they are available online that culture change uh, that um, John Barford mentioned in the first presentation has really come to the fore in in the way you manage um, your your research capacity and how you work towards those goals. So uh, fair play uh, and um, I'm dying to see more. One other thought, last thought, I suppose, would be because it, it's quite like the authentic learning the National Forum are, are um, advocating and it's also a kind of paralleling what Suha mentioned in her site visits so people could go and visit the, the um, specific off-site construction and look and feel and see and learn from that perspective and take away from it uh, whether they're in, in undergraduate postgraduate education or in a work environment as part of their lifelong learning. It, it is essentially living the dream if you like you are doing what I suppose we all aspire towards doing and we need to do a lot more of um, and so case studies like like yours or live live sites it might be interesting maybe to revisit this you know perhaps next year through the National Forum again and look more for industry input into professional development and how we can get those messages across to people who are working in practice and people who are working in education like myself and students uh, and that to try and learn from each other a little bit more um, because it, they, there's just so much else that we can discuss uh, you know but I think that we have probably run out of time. I don't know if anybody else in the panel here now would like to add any further comments. Um, you know, I've just found it all very interesting this afternoon it's been uh, fascinating hearing about everyone's CPD and the, the way it's approached differently. And I would just like to agree with everything everyone has said about the sort of cross disciplinary working and the use of different tools. Um, you know, that's a big part of my work and I think it's really important. We just need to keep on doing more of that. Absolutely. Anybody yeah. else? Thanks very much, Arian. It's been really interesting, as Joanna said. It's uh, great to see so many like minded people and uh, yeah. I think I think you should be running an annual event. <laughs> We should try and do that so I think so yeah yeah uh, and we can read some of those papers <laughs> uh, a little light reading for everybody to take away and do some homework thank you so much everyone thank you okay thank I you. think we'll wrap it up now what I'd thank like you. to do if it's okay just to share um, one more PowerPoint it's just uh, my colleagues in the academic society in Engineers Ireland have our next presentation again with the National Forum and I was asked just to let everybody know at the end of the presentation when it's on and uh, again it's a hybrid event I don't believe it's online uh, but uh, just uh, my colleague uh, Kevin Delaney in the Academic Society had asked would I let people know about this so just to share my screen before we finish up the, the next uh, Engineers Ireland Academic Society uh, webinar is going to be co-hosted alongside the National Forum. Uh, Kevin actually did the same thing as me and he went ahead with it from that perspective. So his presentation is going to be, or his uh, uh, webinar seminar, sorry, is Thursday the 17th of February uh, from 11 to 12.30 and the title he has is Teaching Sustainability to our Students. So again, the SDGs you've seen a few people mention in their presentations, it's kind of looking at that from the, the area of, of teaching and learning and it, you know, it particularly embedded in mechanical engineering is Kevin's area, mechanical engineering education so that's one if you want to get a hold of Kevin to ask him a bit about that his email address is there and it's on the National Forum website too. I think he's to set up Eventbrite yet and whatever so uh, we, we'll give him a few weeks and he'll be on the on the ball there. Thanks again so much to all our speakers um, to Dr Kevin Cunningham for keeping things running smoothly in the background. 
quiet but steady. It's wonderful to have you there. Thank you so much, Kevin, and your wonderful student ambassadors um, who've been present and waiting and watching and hopefully learning all of this. So there'll be questions now when we're back on campus for lectures next week. Uh, Tom, Edward and Christopher, thank you so much. Uh, and to all our attendees, really appreciate you coming online uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. We'll have it all tidied up as a recording and maybe share some of the material that we have put together with our, all of the attendees and the speakers and the helpers as well. So uh, we will should be all be able to um, work our way towards it. Just to mention as well um, that it will be we'll do generating some publications uh, uh, from the findings from the survey um, and we'll be going through Engineers Ireland uh, hopefully through the Engineers Ireland Journal, which is, is not open access, it is open to our membership, which is a quite substantial number. And we'll also do this through CABE. Um, the event was shared through CABE uh, to make people know of it. Um, and we'll, we'll try and do the same and get it published through CIAT as well. So it's a few kind of uh, ways that we can get these things disseminated and by email, uh, you know, when we have some sort of a report and a recording, I'll circulate to everyone by email. So um, you'll be well uh, versed, you know, and have access hopefully to this and um, all the rest of the findings. And you can contact the speakers directly if you're interested in their research and want to learn more as well. OK, thank you very much. We call it a day. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.